run on IBM. And the third team, they are calling themselves Team Fuzzy Bell, which is uh, Thomas, Christian, and Mark. Um, they made, I think, the best, the best output and the best presentation. Actually, part of the hackathon was Markus, also Matthias in the background, is in, in, in the jury. And unfortunately, uh, um, our friend uh, Fred Jendrajewski, Jendrajewski, oh, it's a hard, hard name, um, who's a professor at the uh, University of Heidelberg, cannot participate today. So maybe he's watching us. So the stage is yours about secure communication using quantum computing. Genau das Mikrofon nehmen, weil hier ist das Mikrofon für die. Das ist das, das, ist das Mikro, das werfe ich rum. Das, genau. das, das. Und ihr müsst hier die Pfeile weitermachen. Ja, es gibt keinen Präsenter. Wir haben keine freien USB-Plätze. Alles klar. New Media. Alright. Good evening, everyone. It's a big opportunity to be here today. Therefore, we want to thank your quantum to being here and to talk about secure communication with entangled particles. I have to go over that. So, who are we? We are, how, how already mentioned, Fuzzy Bell. And we had a team consisting of this guy from to the left, Thomas Decker. He's a computer scientist and software developer at Exasol. Next to him is Marco Mess. She's a physicist and an and AI engineer at Devisible. And my name is Christian Gauss. I'm a mathematician and software developer at Innoclock. So, what have we done at the hackathon? Thinking about secure communications with entangled particles, therefore, we need one thing, of course, entangled particles. So, our, so we asked ourselves, is it possible to produce these entangled particles on nowadays accessible quantum computers? And we tried to produce a, a so-called bare state. So our agenda for today is these three parts, communication, entanglement, and the quantum making results. I will start with the communication. I will show you some issues today, and I will provide you some idea how um, how the Q communication can work with entangled particles. After that, Ma will do some something like a deep dive into into the theory of entanglement. And the third and last part of our talk will be done by by Thomas. He will present our quantum making results. So let's start with communication. So we're living in an increasingly connected world. More and more data is being exchanged. And with more and more data, of course, more sensitive data. Looking at this picture, back then there were telephone operators responsible that the right connection was done between the right persons. And if some call was intercepted by anyone, I think it was not such a big deal because, yeah, at least when you was, were um, an average person, person. Today, everything's changed, changed. We have a different situation. Just think about the smartphone. Almost every electronic device nowadays is connected to the internet. Banks, industries, I mean, the whole world, almost con con connected to the internet. And so you can say data became valuable. And something valuable has to be protected. That's the reason why we need a strong foundation to provide secure communication. So let's take uh, these examples here. For example, automotive. We are in an era or on the edge that we will, will have some self-driving cars in the future. And self-driving cars have to communicate with each other. They have to act like a swarm. 
And of course, we don't want that anyone can manipulate this information shared with among the cars. And when talking about security, it comes along that we are talking about encryption, symmetric keys, asymmetric keys, and lots of different other things. But there are some problems with all these encryption things. For example, we have to, to store the, the key somewhere, maybe in a public private field, we have a third party certification. And like every system, also the third party can, could be compromised. And so the keys could be stolen. And the thing with the stolen keys is it's, it's a really interesting thing because I think that's the main problem when we think talking about security, because we have no warning system when a key is copied by anyone. We just see the result when it's too late. So the idea about all the things we're doing here, all the things about secure communication is to, to secure the protect the system by physics itself. And I already have mentioned, I have said that the problem is that keys can be copied. And like I think many of you know, there's a so-called no cloning theorem. That means that we cannot clone a quantum mechanical state, state. by measuring or look, as a, looking at it, we're destroying the system. And so I will, now I want to show you some really high level, high level stuff about how such a quantum key distribution would work. Should I come before? Okay. All right. I think I sit down here. So, all right. Um, at this situation, we have Alice and Bob, and then they want to communicate with each other and they want to share a, a key with each other to secure their communication. And the idea is to do, is to do it with entangled pair, with an entangled pair of particles. So entanglement, just a, just a brief overview. What we need right now is entanglement means of these two particles, that there's a clo really close connection between them. And this cloud connection is also there, no matter how far, far they are apart. And the important thing here is, when we take a measure of one of these particles, this connection between these particles breaks. And this is something we want to use in this, in this example with a quantum mm -hmm. infinite. So imagine there's, somewhere, there's some generator somewhere out there that produces entangled pairs. Right, so if there's no eavesdropper, everything's fine. They will be sent to Alice and to Bob, and Alice and Bob, each, each of them, do some, some measurement of these particles. For example, with some polar, polarization filter of, of photons. So we are, we are doing this thing many, many times. And after some time, this generates an, an key. So, and with this key, everything's fine. They can communicate through the classical internet with each other. Now, the interesting part comes in. Eve, and she's evil, how you can see. <laughs> right. Uh, think about that, um, that the generator, generator creates, creates another pair of entangled particles. So, how you have already seen before is when you try to measure one of them and try to steal the information, she will, uh, she will destroy the connection between these two particles. So the following happens. And this is the thing. Now, because the connection is broken and we will do it for more, more several times, at the end, Alice and Bob have different keys. And that's a good thing. Because right now, it's really easy to, to test if, if everything went fine. So for example, Bob could produce a test message and send the encrypted message to Alice. 
Yeah, but the thing is, the mess uh, Eve have got a different key, so the message will be some nonsense, and she, so she will know that that the, the system was corrupted by anyone. So, what's the state of the art? Yeah, this is really cool. Um, there are already some companies building some devices for quantum, quantum internet and quantum key distribution. Here, for example, we've got ID Quantique. This thing on the right, uh, on the left, this device produces random numbers because nowadays it's really not possible with classic computers to produce these numbers. But with photons, you can do it. And what I have already mentioned, or why I talked about quantum key distribution, is the device on the right. It's, it's actually a commercial quantum key distribution system that you can buy. But it just works over short distance and slide them up to 70 kilometers. So you can imagine. So you can imagine. Uh, think about the internet, 70 kilometers are not enough. But there are also other companies building on the so called quantum internet. In this case, KPN and QTEC. There are several other things uh, doing this, but this is just an example. And the cool thing, um, Right now, they want to provide the first test quantum internet next year. And yeah, I'm really curious about it. And the cool other, other cool thing is that they've got something, it looks like the really first internet live in 1969. There are also four different places and they try to send some messages. And of course, China. China has already sent and, and quantum satellite two years ago, and they were able to send entangled particles to down to the earth. So this was my part of the talk. Um, the, uh, yes, so I hand over to Ma, and she will describe the theory of entanglement. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Well, we know classical physics and what classical physics say about the reality. The physical properties are independent of observation. We don't need to measure them. Um, later came um, quantum physics, where the statistical nature of the reality were um, shown. And uh, the quantum mechanics says that the physical properties are dependent of observation. And there is a problem with uh, entanglement uh, and entangled particles, because in this case, the special relativity is broken, it doesn't work. And Albert Einstein, Boris Podolsky, and Martin Rosen was uh, three of uh, many physicists, uh, they were um, not happy with this theory. We thought this was an incomplete theory. And I saw you why this was a problem. So what is quantum entanglement? And what is an entanglement entangled system? An entangled system is a system whose uh, quantum state can be um, factorized as a product of a single quantum system uh, Quantum states of his uh, singular of his, uh, of singular um, components, uh, but we we cannot describe the physical properties of this particular particle uh, particle here without you know the other physical particles of the another one. They are all a whole. We can we should uh, see this connected uh, particles as a whole, and uh, we also were able. And um, we, when we try to measure one of these particles, the problem is that all the quantum system collapses, and this happens instantaneously. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter how far away one particle is for another one, this was a problem, and this was why uh, the EPR group was not happy with this theory because um, 
The information from one particle to the another one cannot travel faster than light. And um, they thought there should some there shouldn't be some hidden hidden variable in every particle who is definite uh, defined at, at first uh, before the this, uh, the particles are separated. And um, with this theory, Bell, John Bell, 30 years after this theory, demonstrated that this theory doesn't, already doesn't work. This theory about hidden variable phase when uh, we try to measure spin of these particles um, along some uh, axis. Bell found and a value an upper limit they can be broken uh, if we, we work with uh, entangled particles. And what is this well inequality? We can reproduce this experiment. For this, we need Alice, Charlie, and Bob. Charlie prepares two particles, one for Alice and one for Bob. And um, Alice and Bob has to measure devices. And every, every device can measure a property of this particle. And uh, the only for simplicity, we uh, choose the uh, Output of every uh, every measure as plus one or minus one. We are trying to calculate this quantity here, and um, since r and q are plus or minus one, either this quantity here or this one must be zero. And at the end, the, the quantity we are looking for is plus or minus two. Well, because um, there is some noise in this experiment, of some could be uh, could be that um, Charlie don't reproduce this experiment every time every time at the same way. We need to make um, the expected value, the average of all the measures. And if we do that, we become at the end this bell inequality. This means if we reproduce this experiment many times, we can now get a value of bigger as two. But this spell inequality is not about quantum mechanics. Spell inequality is about common sense. This is what the uh, EPR group wanted. And we reproduce, we, we should now uh, Try to understand what Bell founded, why he says this doesn't work for entangled particles. For this, we prepare a second um, experiment. Charlie prepared this time a quantum system. This is a quantum system for entangled particles. And um, the system has two qubits. Then Charlie uh, sends uh, the first qubits to Alice, Alice, and the second one to Bob. Alice and Bob have the same. Uh, do the same as before, and uh, they have uh, this measurement device. And with the quantities of the average, the expected values of every term, we found that the two values are different. And um, Bell was right, and this theory about this hidden variable doesn't doesn't work for quantum uh, for entanglement particles. Bell demonstrated this. Um, we can see um, in July this year we could see uh, the first M photo of a strong form of quantum entanglement. This was taken in the University of Glasgow. Um, this was taken with different um, uh, axes. And we can see more clearly in this graph the difference because uh, between classical and quantum um, measurements. If we take into account now the antiparallel measurement, when um, Alice measure uh, as a device and measure um, 
one direction above uh, to the measurement and the uh, opposite direction, they become almost the same, same result. And the correlation can be calculated as the product, across the product of these two. If these uh, um, outputs are the same, the correlation is plus one. And uh, if we make the average of all these uh, values, we become one. In the second case, Alice take the device and do the measure in one direction and both do the same, uh, the same measurement in the same direction. And this is a parallel measurement. It means because the particles are entangled, they become always the opposite um, outputs. And the correlation is always minus one. And the uh, average of these values is always minus one. That is the case here. The last one is in the case when Alice takes zero walk, um, zero degrees, one direction above uh, the 19 degrees or 270. And in this case, 50% of the time. Um, agree with the Alice and Bob agree with the, the outputs, and 50% of the time don't agree with and the correlation. The average of correlation is uh, zero. And in between, we have this difference between the quantum and classical um, um, measurements. And we try now, Thomas will try now to explain how we take. This value here. So now we want to present our results from the hackathon. Our goal was to show the violation of Bell's inequality on a real quantum computer. And So the question is, how do we get a quantum computer? So nowadays you get everything on the internet. So it's possible to get a quantum computer on the internet. Uh, we took the IBM Q experiment. You can just create an account, log in, and every day you can run a small amount of calculations on real quantum hardware. And when you log in, you see a page like this. Uh, here are some result sets with simulators, or here the real hardware. And here's a list of available hardware. And other options are also available. So for the hackathon, we were on a tight schedule. We had to choose a quantum computer that's um, more available than others. And at that time, it was this quantum computer that had, had the shortest queue. So when you submit a uh, Calculation, you have to wait until your job is uh, calculated. And this quantum computer uh, has to, some properties you can read on the web page. You have just to click on it, and then you see some information the error rates, the support of its basic gates, and the topology of the qubits. And for us, we just need two qubits, so this quantum computer is sufficient. It's even bigger than we need. So that was. Uh, what we have chosen, and now we have access to quantum computer, but how do we really use it? So, for this case, we used um, something called HISFIT, which is provided with this uh, uh, from this webpage by IBM. And it's basically just a Python library. We can construct quantum circuits. We have backends for simulators, so you can run it locally on your computer just to check whether there's an error or not. And with a very small change, you can also run it on actual quantum hardware. And you can do many more things, but that's what we need. So we have an experiment with the Bell state. We have already seen this. And now the first task is to generate this quantum state. So we tried out and found a way how to do it. And that actually from 
everything you need. So basically, we just import the library. We define a quantum circuit with a quantum register of two qubits. So you have one qubit and the other one. And then you apply several operations. So we have to figure out which operations are needed. And that looks like this, so four small operations. Uh, this is a single qubit operation. This is a conditioned two-bit qubit operation. This also, and that's another operation. Then we can just ask this toolkit to calculate it on a wet form simulator, and then we get the result. And it's it's correct. So with this circuit, we already solved uh, the problem to generate this spell state. So that was part one of the problem, and now we have. Bigger problem, we have to implement different measurements as you have seen on the slide before this one. Alice has two measurements, and both has also two measurements, and they are different. So, what is available? How do we measure? So, this KISP toolkit for the quantum computer provides us with a single, very simple standard measurement. That's usually assumed that's the measurement you have in a quantum computer system. So, we have a single qubit. Here have the measurement, and the result is a zero or one. So, for instance, if we have a quantum state that looks like this, so it's just a superposition of zero and one with equal magnitude, then it's roughly saying half zero and half one. And with this measurement, so first we generate the state from that zero. Here you have this data. Then we make this a standard measurement. The result is zero or one. Then we obtain roughly fifty percent zero, roughly. 50 so that's not easy to do, but of course that doesn't solve directly our problem because we have QS, RS, and so on to solve that and perform. And this can be solved in the following way. So we have results zero and one, but that's not really relevant. We can also just call it one and minus one. It's just the renaming of the result. It's just classical information, so it doesn't matter too much. And what's more important, we have to apply an upper gate order to transform this measurement into such a measurement. So here we have actually two measurements, that's for Alice and for Bob, and so we need two of these building blocks in order, no, sorry, yeah. in order to build our measurement. And the main problem is for each of these measurements to find the appropriate unit. Is it? Next step. So we start with QNR because that's quite easy. When you do the calculation with these formulas we had on some previous slides, it's just a diagonal matrix. And that's very nice because that's just the standard measurement. It's an observable, and this corresponds to this. And we just relay. <laughs> Thank you. OK. So we just relabel the outputs to 1 and minus 1, and that's everything we need for use. And you see the code in Python is quite short for this, that's very nice. And the R measurement looks like this, that's a bit more complicated, but as it turned out, we can just apply such an operation on the qubit, and then we do the standard measurement, and then we have already implemented this measurement. So that's also pretty easy. Now uh, we come to S and T. These are the measurements for Bob. These are different measurements. And they look a bit more complicated, and this was a bit more work to find out how to do it. But uh, luckily, there's a new 3 gate on this quantum hardware, and it's rather powerful. And then it turned out that we just need for this measurement one of these operations. This is a more complicated gate, but it's there, so we can use it. And then the measurement T is quite similar. We have just different minus signs. And basically, just the same with another gate after this UC gate. So this was all done by some cumbersome calculations, but at the end, the result is very small. But you have to find these uh, factors. And as we have seen, the measurements have different number of gates. And this um, T1 was the most complicated one. So we have. The creation of the state, that's here. These are the four gates we had on one of the previous slides. And then we constructed this 
the circuit. So we have two qubits that say this belongs to Alice and this belongs to Bob. And then we generate this uh, Del state. And then Alice and Bob must make some measurements. So Alice is performing just a standard measurement, or Alice can choose to implement this and then in the measurement. So Alice can choose between Q and R. And Bob is basically doing the same. So we had this U3 gate or U3 and this X, but here was a minus sign, and this is just subtracting it twice. So we get the minus two times U6 at the end. So this is basically uh, what the, the experiment is about. And here we must choose randomly between Q and R and between S and C. So we have an attempt to. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> so we had a first try. Yes, to, uh, generate the, yeah. to generate the random numbers here uh, with a quantum circuit, make a measurement, we get a random number, and then apply this random number to choose between the measurements. Uh, it worked on the simulator, but on actual hardware, it does not work. It leads to an error code, most likely because a measurement is a very uh, destructive operation. So after measurement, not too many things can be done anymore. And to feedback the result, to the circuit is also very complicated, most likely. So I guess this measurement is when you run it on the computer done at the end. So there's some optimization going on when you submit a job, which is not uh, totally clear. We did not check it out, but this circuit did run. So what have we done? We cannot generate the random numbers inside the circuit. So we just created these four circuits separately. So we have the combination QS, QP, and so on. These are four circuits, we run them separately and combine the results appropriately afterwards. Of course, this introduces some loopholes because uh, the L theorem is about what physical systems are and what can they do. And here we are somehow modifying the experiment in a certain way. And of course, if you really want to know something about physics, this experiment is not that useful anymore, but it's still okay for proof of concept. In Bell's experiment, we had a huge distance between particles and in this quantum computer, of course, we cannot do it anyways, because the quantum computer is pretty uh, limited in size. So the whole experiment is just a proof of concept. So we want to see can the rotations, which are actually uh, these operations be done and so on. So we introduce some problems here, but the result, so the probabilities we see, the values are still Okay, next one. These circuits, we have four, uh, were used on a simulator, and you see the results here. So we did 1,000 runs or something like this for each circuit, and you see the probabilities here. We have QS, RS, RT, and QT is different. And as you might remember, this QT expectation value was subtracted from the others. And that's actually a nice fit here. You see everything is positive except for this. And then you have anything up, you have 2.8, which is two times square root of two, as expected. Of course, we did only a limited number of experiments. So we have roughly two times square root two, as expected. And on the simulator, it's quite nice. And next, we did it on the real hardware. And we obtain during the hackathon this result. And you see these graphs look not as nice as the simulated graphs, but still you can see the shape. So this one looks pretty good. This is also quite okay. And here you already see that there is some noise coming in here, especially that looks not like this. But as we remember, RT were, were quite complicated measurements. They had more gates than the others, so it's reasonable that there is more error uh, for this measurement than for the other ones. And so we did a calculation. Here you see the values. This is it disturbed, so we have not the square root two, but still approximately it's quite good. And if you add it up, you have 2.39, which is above two. So that was our main goal. We wanted to see can we get a value that's bigger than two? And apparently it was bigger than two. So that was our main result. And now we have all the measurement circuits and everything working. Then the question is, what happens if we have no entanglement? So I assume uh, that 
we somehow get entangled particles because we pay for it, and now somebody who provides us with the entangled qubits gives us wrong qubits and wants to fool us, so to take the money and do not give us entanglement. And if you want to fool somebody, maybe you can try this one. So with 50% probability, you give this thing, or with 50% probability, you give this one. So this is not an entanglement, it's just a normal classical selection. I take this one or that one with 50% probability. And if we are able to spot, can we be fooled? And when we run bell tests, we know it should not be possible to fool us. So I, we did the experiments with this kind of state. And when you sum it up, you see for the Q measurement, it still looks exactly like it looked for the entangled state. But now if Alice decides to change the measurement to R, everything looks totally different. So basically you will have a, just a probability distribution of one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, and so on. So it looks totally different. And you see the value is not sure what that So with this, uh, you can also see that if there's no entanglement, the value two is not in this case. So now <laughs> we have shown you the, the results. Uh, let me quickly conclude. So we thought about uh, secure communication during the hackathon, and what it means. We came up that entanglement could help a lot, and that would, it could give new features for key exchanges. And then, uh, after having a look at the theory of entanglement, how can we prove that there is entanglement or how can we detect it, uh, we decided to give it a try on a quantum computer. And we have seen that our result is above two. That was what we wanted. Of course, it does not really mean that we have broken that theory because we are restricted to a very small place and there are other problems with our setup, but basically we did all the operations and the calculations to show that something happened that is interesting. And here are our sources. <coughs> and if you have any questions, um, please ask. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Very tough. <laughs> Any questions here? Kai, one second. Um, please, uh, can you explain why do you use U3 uh, gate for a solution? So basically, on the quantum computer, you have standard measurements, and there is respect to the standard basis of C11, but our measurement is not of this kind. So we have to rotate the measurement basis. And that's basically uh, this U to transform our measurement basis into the right basis. And we need this operation because we have only have one measurement available. And in order to get all of these other the other measurements, we need something to do before we use the measurement. It's um, just turning the vector basis. So, well, what is your specific? Yeah, because uh, by U3, you have three parts of phases. Uh, you yeah, we just use one of these. Yeah, maybe another way could also work. Ah. Uh, it's just the first we found that worked. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a simpler way, U1, whatever. Or, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, so I actually have two questions. Uh, one is uh, at some point I don't, I don't know if I am so well. At, uh, so the whole key was the key point was to you generate this pair of particles and we send to Alice and one is evolved and someone is seeing this thing in this collapsing state and, and, and you could detect uh, when that happened. Is that connected with the last thing you, you the last experiment you made in the in the machine? Or uh, the last one, this no entanglement. Yeah. Uh, that was just a simulated result, so it was not done on Mulaga. But basically, yes, that would happen if you keystroke and 
you manipulate the state, you will mm -hmm. get something like that. Okay. Yeah. And then the, 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 the other part would be cool if instead of measuring something, you're simply receiving this particle and generate two new particles, send one to both and get this one. And in that case, both will not see this. And it will, once they measure it, it will get some result. Will that still allow if to actually see the communication? Like instead of just measuring, just creating a new pair of particles. Okay. That also entangled. Uh, the problem with this thing is that when if is just creating new a new pa pair of particles and sending them to Alice and to Bob, then she uh, was this a question? No, no. So ah. one is sent to Alice, and yeah. then the other one is captured by if, if we yeah. create a new pair, mm -hmm. send one to Bob and keep the other one. Mm -hmm. So Bob and Alice get particles. One can measure, and the other one will see the result. Mm -hmm. Then if also will see the result. That's kind of. Uh, but but here's the thing that. Alice and Bob gets two different, uh, yeah, they mentioned two different pairs that are not connecting, connected with it, each other. So then. Can you generate a particle where with a particular, I guess you, you measure a spin or a polarization or something like that. Could you generate a particle? Is, it, is that possible or not? To generate a pair that has the same property, like without meshing, it's going to preserve the property and it's going to be in to. So the question is, I don't know if I understood it. Um, if Eve could produce something like the same pair of yeah. as the as the incoming part. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting question because um, it's all about statistics when you when you when you're talking about it. So that means that Eve should do a lot of measurements until they, she can figure out what kind of particles it is. No, you know but it's, it's not possible, like these devices, when they split, mm -hmm. like, uh, like uh, photons, like, like a beam of light, they are split. Mm -hmm. So who, this split actually reproduces the particle and they are entangled that uh, devices that do that. Mm -hmm. Like some materials can allow a beam of light and split and it has these two beams are entangled. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to kind of allow beam if, if to get one particle that's entangled to the one that's sent to both and with the same property as in common? Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. It may not be possible. But, you know. I think she could produce something like this, but I don't know. But she should make a lot of measures until she knows the properties of the particles. I, I don't really think this is possible. Okay. Uh, really. I don't see the how can we possible be um, uh, this this entanglement. Um, so Charlie sends these two part two particles to to Alice and Bob and Eve. Take one of them. It, but it's in not, this it's moment, to, it's you, not going to measure the particles. So it's not oh. going to collapse the wave. It's simply going to. As a spirit that's going to generate two new particles that are going to be entangled, one is going to be sent to Bob, and Eve is going to keep the pair. Then Bob becomes two, or? No, no, Bob will get a, one of the pairs that was generated after. For example, is it possible to generate three particles that are entangled? Are there experiments with? I don't see. It. Is that not, that's yeah, not I possible? Don't, I, I don't think that's possible. You only feel like it's not possible. Maybe it's okay. yeah. after course, right? afterwards, because. There are maybe some more questions, but thanks very much. <laughs> we get back to it. Um, anybody else? All right. Then this was our last talk. Again, thank you very much. I think we have some open questions I see in some faces, so we can talk. And have some beers and drinks and maybe some rest of the pizza. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. 